Noah knew it was already late, and that he should have gone to bed, but instead he found himself unable to tear away from yet another story about a wife cheating on her husband. He wondered whether these stories were even real. Could someone truly betray the person they'd promised to love? These stories stuck in Noah's mind, planting seeds of doubt and anxiety. Without realizing it, he began to observe his wife Amelia more closely, scrutinizing her every move and conversation. When they went dancing, Noah started feeling uneasy if Amelia got too close to another man. He even secretly checked her laundry, searching for signs of infidelity. Noah first met Amelia at her sister Olivia's wedding, never suspecting that Olivia and her new husband loved to entertain themselves with other couples. From the moment they met, Noah and Amelia shared a deep connection, and a year later, they married. Their first child, Connor, was born two years later, and four years after that, they welcomed Susan. From the outside, their family seemed the picture of happiness, but due to conflicting work schedules, they had little time for each other. The situation was made worse by Olivia and her husband Jake, notorious for their wild parties and the rumors surrounding their lifestyle. Noah never liked Jake, especially after he started flirting with Amelia at their wedding reception. Early in their relationship, Noah and Amelia made a pact never to discuss past relationships, knowing both were prone to jealousy. However, one day, Amelia asked Noah to drop by Olivia's place to fix a kitchen faucet. Of course, I'll take care of it, Noah replied with a sly smile. Maybe I'll take care of something else while I'm there. Amelia shot him a displeased look. Don't you even joke about that. She's my sister, she said sharply. Noah raised his hands in mock surrender. I'm just kidding, he said lightly. But as he headed to Olivia's house, thoughts about her infamous lifestyle crept into his mind. Olivia had always been flirtatious, even with him. Still, Noah knew he shouldn't ruin his marriage over something so foolish, or should he? When Noah arrived at Olivia's house, she greeted him, wearing only a revealing robe. Come in, she said softly. I made coffee if you'd like some. Noah's mouth went dry. Well, thanks. I'll just get to work on the faucet, he said, trying to dispel the awkwardness. He bent under the sink to check the pipes. When he stood up, Olivia was right in front of him, her robe barely covering her body. What are you doing, Olivia? he mumbled, stepping back in shock. What do you think? she replied, moving closer. I've wanted you for a long time, Noah. No, stop this. I'm here to fix the faucet. This isn't right. Her face darkened. So, are you going to sleep with me or not? She asked bluntly. No, never. You're Amelia's sister and I love her, Noah said firmly. Fine, Olivia replied coldly. But if you don't give me what I want, I'll tell Amelia that you tried to sleep with me. Who do you think she'll believe? Panicked, Noah fled the house, desperately trying to call Amelia, but she didn't pick up. Late at night at work, Noah struggled to focus, his thoughts consumed by Olivia's threat and the potential disaster it could spell for his marriage. When he finally returned home the next morning, he was shocked to see Olivia's car in the driveway. As he walked inside, chaos greeted him. Jake was hurriedly pulling up his pants, Olivia sat on the couch with a smug expression, and Amelia, clearly drunk, looked terrified. What the hell is going on here? Noah shouted. Without thinking, Noah lunged at Jake, blindly swinging his fists in fury. In the midst of the chaos, someone hit Noah from behind, and everything went dark. When he came to, he found himself lying in a hospital bed, his head throbbing in pain. A police officer stood nearby, explaining that he had been struck with a vase and suffered a concussion. The officer continued, telling Noah that the charges against him had been dropped. Jake claimed he had acted in self-defense saying Noah came home in a fit of rage and attacked him. Amelia, too drunk to remember much, could only recall Noah yelling. The situation had spiraled far beyond anything Noah could have imagined when he left for Olivia's. I have nothing to say, Noah mumbled. You're lucky, Mr. Harper, the officer replied. No charges, but you need to seriously consider your actions. After the officer left, Noah lay there, his head still pounding as he tried to piece together the events. He realized he couldn't stay in a marriage with someone who had betrayed him, but he still needed answers. He called his sister Tracy, asking her to come pick him up. Just then, his phone buzzed. 
It was Amelia. Do you want me to pick you up? She asked. We need to talk, now that we're even. Noah's anger flared. Even? You slept with Jake! He barked. Tracy is coming to get me. I'll pack my things and leave. Leave? Amelia cried. Noah, I only did it because you were with Olivia. Back home, Noah confronted Amelia. Olivia said you came on to her, Amelia accused. That's a lie, Noah shot back. She came on to me and threatened to lie if I didn't go along with it. I refused. Amelia's face showed a mixture of anger and confusion. Why should I believe you? Why would my own sister lie to me? Because she's jealous, Noah replied, his irritation growing. She and Jake sleep with other couples and they wanted to drag you into their games. You let Jake get close and as far as I'm concerned, this marriage is over. No, I only did it to get back at you, Amelia insisted. Olivia knew the details of what happened between you two. Noah's face turned cold and distant. Your sister is a walking disaster. I slept with her back in high school, just like half the guys in town. But that was long before I met you. Amelia's eyes filled with tears. I don't know what to believe anymore. It's not just about Jake, Noah said, his voice icy and detached. It's about trust. Noah stared at Amelia, his voice icy. If I had really attacked Olivia, why didn't she go to the police? His words cut through the air like a knife. Admitted, Amelia, you wanted Jake, and I just became the scapegoat. Tears welled up in Amelia's eyes. No, Noah, I love you, she sobbed. Love? Noah responded bitterly. Love doesn't mean betraying someone with another man. His voice hardened. I'm filing for divorce on Monday. It wasn't supposed to be like this, Amelia whispered through her tears. But Noah had already turned away, indifferently gathering his things. Tell the kids whatever you want. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Pausing at the door, he added coldly, Tracy will handle the meetings with Connor and Susan. The days that followed blurred into one long, emotionless stream for Noah. Long hours at work and sleepless nights in cheap motels became his new normal as he tried to piece his life back together. He met with a lawyer and initiated the divorce process. One afternoon, after picking up Connor from school when the boy fell ill, Noah stopped by the house to grab some of his things. The phone rang. It was Olivia. Already at his breaking point, Noah quickly turned on the recorder on his phone. Unaware, Olivia confessed that she had fabricated the entire attack story. She even admitted that Jake had helped orchestrate the scheme. Noah left with Connor, his heart heavy, but he was filled with resolve. Later, checking his phone, he saw a flood of desperate messages from Amelia, apologizing and begging for forgiveness. But Noah's trust had been shattered. The fact that she had so easily believed the worst about him and discarded their marriage so readily left him broken. On the day the divorce was to be finalized, Noah signed the papers with a heavy heart. The weight of it all drove him to a bar where he decided to drown his sorrows. And that's when he saw Jake. Months of boiling rage, betrayal, and heartbreak exploded. Noah snapped. He lunged at Jake, landing blow after blow until Jake was lying beaten and bloodied on the floor. Burn in hell, you bastard! Noah shouted as three men dragged him off Jake. They pulled him outside, where police threw him to the ground and slapped handcuffs on him. This time, there were no second chances. Noah was going to prison. Once in custody, he made one call. Tracy, I've really messed up this time, he said quietly into the phone. Don't waste money on bail. I'll just serve my time. He heard her sobs before the line went dead. Over the next two months, Amelia tried to visit Noah repeatedly, but each time he refused to see her. When the day of the trial came, Noah pled guilty to assault. The judge handed down a sentence, three years in prison, with time served. During one of Tracy's visits, she told him, Amelia still loves you, Noah. Her whole family is furious with Olivia for lying, and she hasn't signed the final divorce papers. You're still married. Prison turned out to be much worse than Noah had imagined. In the first few months, he got into several fights, ending up in the infirmary twice. His cellmate, Joseph, was serving a life sentence. They said he had killed his unfaithful wife and her lover. Strangely, Joseph began to open up to Noah, telling him stories about how his life had spiraled out of control. One day, during visiting hours, 
Noah was stunned to see Amelia standing before him. Why are you here? he asked, his voice devoid of emotion. Noah, I love you, Amelia said, her voice trembling as she slid the photos of their children across the table. I've made so many mistakes, but I'll wait for you. We can still get through this if you love me too. Noah didn't respond. He stood up without saying a word and walked away, leaving Amelia sobbing behind the visitor's glass. Later that evening, Noah overheard other inmates planning to harm Joseph. Despite his fear of being labeled a snitch, Noah felt he had no choice but to warn Joseph. Joseph listened suspiciously, but took the advice seriously. The next day, Joseph avoided the attack. He had hidden books under his clothes, which softened the blow of a crude weapon. His crew quickly retaliated, beating the attacker until the guards intervened. Amidst the chaos, Joseph remained calm, continuing to eat as if nothing had happened. After the incident, an unexpected bond formed between Joseph and Noah. In the privacy of his cell, Joseph began to open up, asking questions about Amelia and the children. He spoke with quiet longing about his own children who rarely visited him, except for his daughter Victoria. She knows it was her mother who destroyed our family, Joseph admitted. She writes to me every week, but I refuse to let her come here. This place isn't safe. His face lit up with pride when he mentioned Victoria's growing success in law school. In turn, Noah began to share his thoughts on Olivia's betrayal and his inner conflict about Amelia. Do you still love her? Joseph asked bluntly. Noah sighed heavily. Yes, I do, but I can't forgive what she did to our family. And does she love you? Joseph pressed. She says she does, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to trust her again. Joseph's face hardened. Why not? Look where you are right now, man. You've hit rock bottom. If a woman was willing to stick with me in a place like this, I'd consider myself the luckiest guy in the world. What about the lies? The cheating? Noah countered. Joseph chuckled bitterly. Man, you lost everything for the same reason I did. Trust me, if you hold on to that anger, it will destroy you. Don't let it burn you up inside. Joseph's words echoed in Noah's mind, making him reflect on his own feelings. What would he do when he got out? He had no job, no future, no family. The thought paralyzed him. Two months later, Amelia came to visit again. The kids miss you so much, she whispered. Can't we be a family again? I'll do whatever it takes. Noah hesitated. I want to forgive you, Amelia, but every time I close my eyes, I see you with Jake. I hated every second of it, Amelia said, her voice shaking. When I saw your face that night, the guilt was unbearable. I wish I could take it all back. Noah felt his resolve beginning to weaken. But a few weeks later, Tracy came with alarming news. I drove past the house yesterday, she said quietly. Jake and Olivia's cars were parked outside. Noah's thoughts raced in a whirlwind, torn between confusion and rage. Could it be that Amelia had been lying to him all this time? Meanwhile, Joseph, an experienced lawyer, offered his help in preparing for Noah's upcoming parole hearing. Though Noah felt uncertain, he respected Joseph's professionalism and decided to trust him. On the day of the hearing, the parole board scrutinized Noah, asking questions about his behavior in prison and his plans for the future, including housing and work. Noah responded with maximum honesty, explaining that his sister had offered him a place to stay and that his former employer might take him back. One of the board members asked directly, What are the chances you'll end up here again? With determination, Noah replied, I don't plan on ever seeing these walls again. After the hearing, when he returned to his cell, Joseph was waiting, curious about how it went. Noah, unsure of the outcome, just shrugged. I followed your advice, he said. Did you do anything to speed this process up? Joseph smirked. Who knows, kid, he replied, then added with a grin. But if you get out early, I expect you to pay me back for those weekly cigarettes. A few days later, Amelia came to visit again, her face filled with worry. Someone from the parole board came, she said anxiously. Are you getting out soon? What did they ask? Noah immediately pressed her. What did you tell them? He demanded. They wanted to know if you'd be living with me after your release, she explained. 
I told them we're not together anymore, but I'd still let you stay. Noah's face hardened. You swore you'd stop seeing Olivia. Was that the truth? He asked. Amelia shifted uncomfortably. She's my sister, Noah. I don't see her often, but... What about Jake? Noah interrupted. Have you seen him recently? Why are you asking me this? She replied, surprised. Because I don't believe a word you say anymore, Noah said sharply. You promised it was over between you and Olivia, but both she and Jake have been to your house. Is that why you're so nervous about my release? Did something happen between you and Jake? No, it's not what you think, Amelia objected. I can explain. Don't even try, Noah interrupted coldly. Tell your boyfriend that when I get out, I'll finish what I started that night at the bar. And if you're lying to me again, I'll deal with you too. Amelia ran out, crying. Noah's worst fears were confirmed. He was being dragged back into the same chaos that had landed him in prison. He didn't really want to kill anyone, but he was determined to make them afraid. That night, he called his sister Tracy, asking her to come as soon as possible. When she arrived the next day, Noah told her everything that had happened with Amelia. Tracy sighed deeply. Oh, Noah, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize things were still this bad between you two. Noah nodded grimly. I need to know the truth. Can you watch the house and let me know who comes by? Of course, Tracy reassured Noah, her voice calm but supportive. I'll do whatever I can to help you. She paused before leaving and then added, Oh, by the way, the parole board contacted me too. They asked if you could stay with us if you were released early. Noah looked at her curiously. And what did you tell them? I told them without hesitation that you would always be welcome here, Tracy replied warmly. William agrees with me. Noah felt a wave of relief wash over him. Thank you, Tracy. I really don't know what I'd do without you. Oh, one more thing, she continued. They reached out to Mr. Parker about your old job. Seriously? And what did he say? Tracy's smile widened. He said you could always come back. In fact, he called you one of his best employees. For the first time in a long while, Noah felt a glimmer of hope. I appreciate everything you're doing, Tracy. I hope they don't reject me. They won't, she said confidently. With a job and a place to stay, they said there's a good chance you'll be released next month. Tears filled Noah's eyes as he hugged his sister. And, as she had predicted, Noah got the call a week later. His release was set for the following week. Strangely, instead of meeting with the parole officer, Noah was asked to meet with a lawyer. It turned out that a well-known law firm had become involved in his early release. As he packed his belongings, Noah thanked Joseph, promising to continue sending him cigarettes, though he wasn't sure if the old man had anything to do with it. But it felt right to do so. When Noah finally stepped through the prison gates, Tracy was already there, tears in her eyes. They embraced for a long time before heading to her house, where William greeted him with warmth and kindness. Once they settled in the living room, Tracy broke the silence. So, what are your plans now? Noah took a deep breath. I think I need to call Amelia. I want to arrange a meeting with the kids. I promise I won't cause any trouble. When Noah contacted Amelia, she agreed to the meeting but warned him that at the slightest hint of trouble, she would contact the authorities. Noah assured her that all he wanted was to see his children. The reunion with Connor and Susan was overwhelming. The children ran into his arms, shouting, Daddy! Daddy, you're home! He held them tightly, astonished at how much they had grown. Later, as he and Amelia sat together on the porch, the tension between them was palpable. What do you want from me, Noah? she asked cautiously. We're not together anymore. I'm trying to move on. They're my children too, Amelia, Noah said firmly. I want to be a part of their lives. I was willing to forgive you, he said, his voice filled with frustration. But you lied to me again. You're still seeing Jake and Olivia. Her eyes flared with anger. Noah, you were in prison. I was alone. Don't bother, Noah replied harshly. I know what's going on between you. I don't care who you're with now. But if you expose my kids to that toxic life, I'll fight for them. Noah watched her, barely concealing his irritation as she began speaking with a trembling voice. Noah, I would never do anything to hurt our children. Really? Noah snapped, his words dripping with bitterness. 
You've already torn our family apart because of Jake. I just want to make sure my kids stay away from people like him. Tomorrow I'm meeting with a lawyer to find out what rights I have as their father. Noah added firmly. Amelia's face darkened. Please, Noah. You've misunderstood everything, she pleaded. But Noah was already leaving. He had said all he wanted to, and now his focus was entirely on rebuilding his life and protecting his children. The next day, Noah walked into the law firm that had once secured his release. Approaching the reception desk, he told the secretary, I have an appointment with Miss Evans. The secretary gave him a warm smile. Miss Evans will see you shortly. Noah couldn't hide his confusion. The business card clearly said AJ, but in a moment his curiosity grew as a woman in a sharp blue suit approached him. Mr. Harper, I'm Miss Evans, she said, offering a firm handshake. Please follow me to my office, and we'll discuss your case. Noah followed her, still surprised. When they sat down, AJ maintained a calm and confident demeanor. A mutual acquaintance suggested I take another look at your case. There were some key points your previous attorney missed. Noah frowned. But why did you take my case, and who recommended you? A soft smile appeared on AJ. S face. My father Dave thought I could help. You might know him by another name, Joseph. Noah's eyes widened in shock. Wait, you're Victoria, his favorite daughter? She nodded, smiling slightly. Victoria Evans at your service, but you can call me AJ. Now let's continue over lunch. In a quiet restaurant, AJ explained the terms of Noah's parole and the legal steps he needed to take. But Noah, intrigued by her presence, couldn't resist shifting the conversation. Tell me more about yourself, Noah said, his curiosity evident. AJ smiled knowingly but shook her head. Noah. Discussing my personal life with a client would be inappropriate. But Noah couldn't hold back and blurted out, You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, and those dimples when you smile. A faint blush appeared on AJ's cheeks. Noah, I don't date clients, but thank you for the kind words. Now let's stay focused on your case. Undeterred, Noah persisted. Okay, but as your client, can I at least know a little about your professional background? A.J. chuckled softly. All right, fine. I earned a full scholarship to law school and have specialized in criminal law ever since. As lunch drew to a close, Noah couldn't help but feel increasingly captivated by A.J. or Victoria, as he now knew her. Will we be seeing each other again soon? He asked as they were about to part ways. We'll meet next week to finalize some documents for your parole, A.J. replied. And we can have lunch again if you'd like. Next time. It's on me. Noah couldn't suppress a smile. That works for me. Remember, this is strictly for work, Victoria said with a hint of authority in her voice, though the slight smile on her lips suggested otherwise. In her office, she held Noah's hand just a little longer than what would have been appropriate as they said goodbye. He silently hoped she didn't see him as an awkward ex-con. Before leaving, he made sure to tell her how much he was looking forward to their next meeting. As he stepped out, Victoria's assistant gave him a knowing look. Noah quickly realized that Victoria was unlike most lawyers. Over the next two meetings, everything went strictly according to plan. Victoria remained purely professional, though Noah couldn't shake the feeling that something more was quietly developing between them. Two weeks later, Victoria informed him that their professional relationship was officially over. So, you're not my lawyer anymore? he asked. I still am. You can always reach out to me if you need, she reassured him. In that case, Victoria, consider yourself fired, Noah smiled. Seriously? After everything I've done for you and I didn't take a single cent? she responded, surprised. Noah nodded confidently. Exactly. You don't date clients, and I want to ask you out on a real date. Dinner, dancing, the whole thing. I know I'm just a working man with a past, but I want to get to know you better, and something tells me you feel the same way. Noah, I do have feelings for you, but what will people think? She hesitated. Forget what others think. Just trust your heart for once, Noah said softly. Victoria took a deep breath. I know it's not sensible, but fine. One date. But don't get any ideas about it becoming more, she warned. That weekend, 
Noah borrowed a car from his sister and drove to pick Victoria up. She looked stunning in an elegant black dress. Over glasses of wine and a refined dinner, Noah asked her about her past. My parents divorced when I was fifteen, she began quietly. My father has been in prison for fifteen years. My siblings and I bounced around between relatives and they still can't forgive him for what he did. I was the one who told him about my mom's affair. Sometimes I wonder if things would have been different if I had kept quiet, she said, trailing off. You did what you thought was right at the time, Victoria. Your father's decisions are his responsibility, Noah assured her gently. Victoria nodded, her eyes glistening as she tried to hold back tears. After he was sentenced, I became obsessed with the idea of becoming a lawyer, hoping I could somehow lessen his punishment. That's why I went into criminal law. But in the end, there wasn't much I could do. He used to be a brilliant lawyer. She paused before adding, He always said he was proud of me for following in his footsteps even if I couldn't help him. Were you ever married? Or is that off limits too? Noah asked playfully. Victoria chuckled softly. A bit of both. It didn't last long and that's all you need to know, she teased. Let's set aside the heavy topics. I'm having a great time. How about we dance? Noah laughed. I'm a terrible dancer. Two left feet, he admitted. Noah cherished every opportunity to hold her closer. Moving slowly to the rhythm of the soft music, he breathed in the familiar scent of Victoria's hair, gathering his courage to gently kiss the top of her head. I don't go on dates often, Victoria confessed, her voice barely audible. My experience with men has made me cautious. Honestly, if it wasn't for your father pushing you toward me, I'm not sure I'd be here today. Noah chuckled. I guess I owe him another pack of his favorite cigars for that. His voice softened as he continued. Victoria, meeting you is the best thing that's happened to me in a long time. I'm ready to earn your trust. If I ever cross a line, just let me know. Later that night, standing on her doorstep, their kiss made Victoria look at Noah with surprise in her eyes. She leaned in for another. Can I come in? he asked. Not tonight, she gently replied, shaking her head. It's still too soon, but call me on Wednesday and we'll talk about next Saturday. As he left, Noah couldn't shake the feeling that he was the luckiest man alive. Over the next two weekends, they continued to see each other, and gradually, Victoria began to open up more. One evening, she decided to share an important part of her life. Noah, if we're going to keep seeing each other, there's something you need to know about my past, she began, her voice steady but serious. I got married while I was still in college. It was a rushed decision because I was pregnant. We were too young, and after I lost the baby, our marriage fell apart. I kept the last name Evans to distance myself from my father's name, Miller. Noah listened intently, and then suggested, How about coming to our family barbecue next Saturday? You could meet my sister and her kids. Victoria hesitated, aware of the importance of the invitation. After a brief pause, she leaned in and kissed Noah passionately, for the first time with real intensity. All right, Noah, she said with a smile. I'd love to come. What should I bring? While Noah spent weekends with Victoria, he continued seeing his kids regularly. During one of their visits, the children told him about their mother, Amelia, and her new boyfriend, Richard, a teacher. At first, Noah felt uneasy, but when his daughter said she liked Richard, his worries eased slightly. Out of curiosity, Noah later asked Amelia about her relationship with Richard. I'm really trying to make things right, Noah, Amelia explained. Richard is a good man. He knows about you and respects your role as their father. Noah nodded, his tone firm but calm. Amelia, the lies you told broke us. If this man matters to you, be honest with him. Don't make the same mistakes. You've already destroyed 13 years of our marriage and our family. Over time, Noah moved into a modest apartment just a mile away from Amelia and the kids. It had two bedrooms so his children could stay with him on weekends. He still often joined Tracy for family dinners and gatherings. One morning while making toast, Noah turned to Victoria and asked, Will you marry me? Her eyes filled with tears. What's wrong? Noah asked, concerned. I'm just thinking about my father, Victoria said softly. 
he won't be able to walk me down the aisle. A week later, when Victoria came to visit Noah at work, he immediately noticed the traces of tears on her face. His smile faded, replaced with concern. What happened? he asked, his voice filled with worry. I called the prison, she whispered, her voice barely audible. My father won't be able to come to the wedding. A life sentence guarantees that, Noah said, hugging Victoria as tears streamed down her cheeks. I wish I could change that, but it's beyond my control, he added quietly. Victoria's father was battling a recurrence of cancer, and doctors had given him only a few months to live. Noah felt utterly helpless, wondering why life was so cruel to someone with such a kind heart, like her father. Victoria, I sent cigarettes to your father, Noah admitted. It was part of the deal we made. She met his gaze with understanding. I know, Noah. He trades them for things he needs. It's not your fault, she reassured him gently. An idea began to form in Noah's mind, but he said nothing, not wanting to give her false hope. After they parted, he made a decision and went straight to the prison, intending to speak with both her father and the warden. When Joseph saw Noah, his face lit up with a smile. Take care of my girl, Joseph said. She deserves someone much better than an old man like me. Noah carefully laid out his idea. Joseph hesitated, unsure, but eventually agreed if Noah could convince the warden. The warden listened patiently but was skeptical. You're asking to hold a wedding inside the prison just so her father can be there? Yes, sir, Noah replied. She hasn't seen him in almost fifteen years. He's terminally ill. We would only need an hour in the chapel. After a long pause, the warden reluctantly agreed, under strict conditions. Noah hurried back to share the good news with Joseph. Joseph handed him the number to a bank account he had been saving for Victoria. Noah then met Victoria at her office to deliver the surprise. How would you feel about having the wedding in a prison? Tears of joy welled up in her eyes. I love you, Noah, more than anything. They went to the bank together, where Victoria opened a safe deposit box. Inside, she found a letter from her father, her mother's wedding ring, and bonds to pay for the wedding. The moment was both bittersweet, a mixture of happiness and sadness. Amelia and Richard's relationship didn't last long. Richard caught her in bed with Olivia and Jake. After Richard moved out, he reached out to Noah and told him that Amelia had been bringing her sister and her husband into the house where the children lived to engage in love affairs. Richard also gave Noah photos proving Amelia's inappropriate behavior, which Noah needed during the custody battle for full parental rights over the children. The trial concluded after four months, and Amelia lost custody of the children, with visitation allowed only in the presence of Noah or his wife, Victoria. My dear friend, the first story has come to an end, and the next story about adultery awaits you. Let's go. I don't know where to begin. First of all, I feel devastated. On top of that, I'm not even sure writing this down will change anything. But this is my reality. Yesterday, Abigail, calling her my wife now somehow feels wrong, came up to me and said she was going on a date. I'm 43 and Abigail is 44. We've been married for 22 years and from the very beginning we decided not to have children. Our plan was always to live for ourselves, without kids, and to be happy. But a few weeks ago, she suddenly started talking about how our life felt stagnant, and maybe having kids could bring a bit of adventure into it. I told her we could discuss it if that was truly something we wanted. I thought we had plenty of time to weigh all the options. Shortly after that, she dropped the idea, calling it just another midlife crisis phase. I didn't give it much thought, assuming it was just a fleeting thought of hers. And then yesterday, she dropped a bombshell I wasn't ready for. She's going on a date with someone from work. A date? At first I thought she was just playing a joke on me. I smirked and said, Nice try, you almost got me. But she just looked at me with wide eyes and said, No, I'm not joking. It was like my brain short-circuited. How do you even begin to comprehend your wife calmly telling you she's going to meet another man for what she calls a date? For the next 20 minutes, I kept convincing myself she was teasing me. I asked why she suddenly wanted to go on a date. Her answer? She needed to break out of the dull routine of our lives and try something new. And that new apparently turned out to be dinner with a colleague. She acted like it was nothing, 
dismissing it as just a dinner. Meanwhile, my head was spinning. She sat me down and said, Remember when I told you that life felt so monotonous and we needed to find something that would bring more joy? I interrupted her, reminding her that we had already made changes. We created a new routine, started having weekly date nights, and even planned short trips every few months. We did everything she suggested, but she brushed it off, saying it wasn't enough. Let me finish, she continued. So I was discussing it at work, and Harry, you know him, my colleague, said he felt the same way about his life. Later, we talked in private, and he opened up about how he's also struggling in his marriage, just like we are. She went on to explain that Harry had the same relationship problems. They discussed it all and decided to go on this so-called informal date in the hope that it would bring a little spark back into their lives. And that's how their dinner plan came about. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I asked her if she even understood what she was saying. Her response? What's so wrong with two people just having dinner together? I kept pressing, asking if it really was just dinner and nothing more. She assured me it was just dinner. Then why, I insisted, do you call it a date? Why not just say you're going to dinner with a colleague? She sighed heavily, her voice laced with disappointment. I just wanted to be honest with you, she said. I never thought you'd take it this way. We called it a date because we both know what this could turn into. Her tone grew sharper. But what kind of reaction was that? She abruptly stood up and glanced at her watch. I'm running late. She mentioned she needed to get ready and mumbled something about regretting starting this conversation. I couldn't hold back and asked, Are you really leaving? Right in the middle of all this? She turned to me, her words dripping with sarcasm. Yes, I'm leaving. And yes, the conversation is over. She had a talent for playing mind games, for pushing buttons to see how I'd react. But this time was different. This time, it really hurt. I sat frozen, trying to process what had just happened. A few minutes later, she peeked out from the room and casually threw out, It's just dinner. Don't get worked up. Let's pretend this conversation never even happened, she added, before disappearing again. I collapsed onto the couch, feeling a mix of confusion and numbness. Then, as if on cue, she reappeared, stunning in a white dress. Oh, look at you, she teased. Your face is the same color as my dress. She smirked, trying to lighten the mood. Relax, we'll have fun later, she said, tossing out quick I love yous, as if that could make everything better. I took a deep breath, telling myself it meant nothing. Just dinner, nothing more. No big deal, right? But the knot of anxiety tightened in my chest, making it hard to breathe. I tried to push those thoughts away. I called a friend, hoping a few beers would help me forget. I wanted to open up, but it felt too early to dig into these feelings. So I disguised the story, as if it were about someone else. My friend's in a tough spot, I began laying out all the details. I wasn't sure if he realized it was really about me, but his response was casual. It's nothing. Just an innocent dinner, right? He said. But his words didn't calm the storm inside me. As I sat there, lost in thought, my phone rang. It was Abigail, asking me to come home. I looked at the clock. It was only 10 p.m. She hadn't been gone long. I'll admit, I felt a wave of relief. It was over, I thought. Probably nothing happened. I let myself feel a small sense of comfort, though the nagging doubts still lingered. When I got home, she greeted me with a tight hug, but my mind was elsewhere, drowning in a fog of uncertainty. I couldn't shake the feeling that she might have made it all up, just to mess with my nerves. Or perhaps it was some kind of test. You know what women are capable of, right? So I asked her directly what was really going on. With a sly smile, she sat me down and began explaining how everything had captivated her. She said she hadn't felt so alive in years, and that this date had given her a rush of excitement. They were even planning a weekend trip. What? That was my breaking point. I exploded, jumping out of the chair in fury. She grabbed my hands, begging me to calm down, assuring me it was all just for fun, a way to rediscover herself. Don't you miss the old me? The Abigail who was vibrant and full of life? she asked almost pleadingly. Look at me, 
I'm halfway back to that version of myself after just a few hours with him. You know I love you and this will only make us happier, she assured me. I could barely believe my ears. Let me get this straight. You want to spend the weekend with him, and you think this is somehow going to strengthen our relationship? Basically, yes, she replied casually. I was struggling to hold it together when I asked the next question. You've already slept with him, haven't you? Anger boiled inside me, and I didn't understand how I hadn't exploded yet. She pushed me away, swearing that nothing physical had happened, yet. But she was still planning to go away for the weekend. I love you, she repeated, but I need to explore this fantasy. It means nothing, just the thought of it excites me. And with that, she offered to prove it to me. I snapped, shouting, Why don't you go and do it today, since you're so desperate to act like a filthy woman? She screamed back, saying they had saved the real fun for the weekend. She was relentless. Nothing would stop her. I was drunk and knew I had to leave before I did something irreversible. I got into my car and drove off. I called a friend and stayed at his place. The next morning I came back to gather my things for work, and there she was, sleeping peacefully, as if nothing had happened. While I was getting dressed for work, she came up to me, hugged me from behind, and whispered, I love you. I pulled away from her. I know you're angry with me, she said softly. But I also know you love me enough to let me do what I need to do to be happy. I didn't say a word. I left for work, feeling utterly broken. I can't think straight. It's Thursday, and on Saturday she'll be leaving with this guy. Despair is choking me. I know our marriage is over. I've stopped pretending I can save it. Now all I think about is how to make her pay for what she's done to me. Last night I made sure she froze. I left her outside in the cold after whatever she was up to. I guess she needed to cool down. After spending the day thinking on Thursday, I finally sat down and began planning my next move. As I mentioned before, there was no way I would allow her to treat me like that. On the way back, I stopped to buy a new lock for the house and arranged for a locksmith to come on Saturday to replace it. I also ordered a new nameplate, this time with only my name on it. When I got home, she was lying there in something sheer and obviously seductive. Her appearance caught me off guard. What game was she playing? With a mischievous smile, she asked, Isn't this enough to make someone desperately want me? I want to look absolutely irresistible on Saturday. She laughed softly and added, I skipped work today to go shopping. Restoring our relationship was no longer my goal. What mattered to me now was gathering solid evidence so that she couldn't twist the truth to her advantage later. My phone was already in my pocket, and the recorder had been on since I walked in. I met her gaze and asked her directly, So you're really going to go through with it, despite the potential consequences? She pressed a finger to my lips and whispered, What consequences? There won't be any. I love you, and you love me too. It's just a little fun, she explained, comparing it to something as casual as going fishing, just to blow off steam. I pushed harder. So you're perfectly okay with sleeping with your colleague? knowing full well that I completely reject this open relationship nonsense. She casually shrugged and said, Yes, yes, yes. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? It's just sex. I'm not planning to marry him. I don't love him. I love you. Coming closer, she pressed her lips against my cheek and whispered again, I love you. But I really want to do this. We only live once, and I want to experience everything. Her touch filled me with disgust, but I didn't pull away, because I needed her every word on tape. The more intimate her behavior became, the clearer the recording would be. Later, I cleaned up and went to meet a friend. This time, I told him everything. Before, I'd tried to preserve Abigail's reputation in his eyes, but now I didn't care. She had insisted on making her behavior clear for everyone to see. My friend, who had already noticed something was off, especially after I spent the night at his place the night before, was shocked when I told him what Abigail was planning. But I kept my full strategy to myself, waiting until everything was finalized before laying all my cards on the table. I simply told him that the marriage was over. He mentioned knowing a lawyer who had helped his brother avoid paying huge alimony to his selfish ex-wife. I asked for the lawyer's contact info. It turned out he had it ready. 
real friends are always prepared to help. That evening I returned home confident that the wheels were already in motion. When she lay still on the bed, turned away from me, I felt the weight of the silence. Grabbing a pillow and a blanket, I was ready to leave. Her voice, soft but with a note of curiosity, broke the silence. Where are you going? I snapped. Do you even care? She turned slightly to meet my gaze. Do you remember our vows? She reminded me, her voice steady but with a hint of sting. We promised never to sleep apart. That's when I lost it. Throwing the pillows back on the bed in frustration, I shouted, Oh, now you want to talk about vows? Let's not forget the other part, the one where we promised not to sleep with others. Do you remember that? Her reaction was as cold as ever. She simply sighed, as if considering my anger an overreaction, and turned back over to go to sleep, as if nothing had happened. I stood there, once again gathering my things before heading for the couch. I couldn't share a bed with a woman who, while lying next to me, was thinking about another man. The whole evening, I watched as she preened and packed, preparing for her special day. Meanwhile, I spent that Friday in a lawyer's office, outlining my demands for the divorce. He listened to the recordings I brought and advised me to gather evidence of their upcoming trip, if possible. But frankly, the recordings were enough. The next morning, while she was in the shower, I rummaged through her luggage and replaced a number of her provocative outfits. She'd always been particular about feeling comfortable during intimacy. The thought of her reaction when she discovered my little switch gave me bitter satisfaction. The irony was that they were heading to some remote cabin deep in the woods. Replacing what I swapped out there would be practically impossible. While I was at it, I scrolled through her phone, trying to find the exact location of their rendezvous. I didn't find the address, but I came across a lengthy conversation between her and him where they discussed their first intimate encounter. But it didn't matter anymore. Our marriage was already over. I didn't have time to screenshot the entire conversation, so I took a few photos of the messages with my phone. For context, we both knew each other's passwords. I just never had the desire to check her phone before. When she came out of the bathroom, I casually asked where she was going. Her cheeks flushed with embarrassment, and she playfully responded, And now you care? I smirked. I just want to know where to pick up your body if your boyfriend chokes you with his massive ego. She laughed at the comment and finally gave me the name of the resort. I didn't waste any time. I immediately sent the information to my lawyer. He assured me that he would gather evidence of their stay. It turns out hotels are quite willing to provide that kind of information to lawyers. Don't ask how it works. He didn't go into details. Soon after, I heard a car honk outside. As she walked to the window, probably about to invite her lover in, I yelled from the other room, Don't even think about bringing him into this house. Both of you would have been carried out of here with broken limbs. She laughed quietly, gazing out the window, and told him to wait in the car, assuring him she'd be out soon. I turned the TV volume all the way up to drown out her voice. I didn't want to listen. As soon as she left, I called a locksmith, asking him to change all the locks in the house. Her name was immediately removed from the nameplate at the front door. I went through her things, packed them into large garbage bags, and tossed them into the backyard. Reality hit me when I saw the empty space in the closet. I collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably, like a child lost in their grief for what felt like an eternity. When I finally pulled myself together, the day had already turned into evening. I realized I had two choices, either drown in regrets over mistakes I hadn't made or take control of my life and move forward. I chose the latter. After a long shower, I went for a walk with a friend, the one who had always been there, reminding me that it was just another Sunday. The next morning, I went to the gym early, determined to clear my mind of any lingering negative energy and then I sat down to write this update. She was supposed to come back that evening, and I couldn't wait to see her reaction when she found the house locked. Abigail was finally getting the dose of reality she'd been asking for. That Sunday, she arrived earlier than I'd expected, likely leaving the resort in a hurry, judging by the way she looked. I watched her pull up to the house, clearly irritated. All the joy she'd left with had evaporated, 
replaced by annoyance and disappointment. Her makeup was smeared, and she looked terrible. Her latest lover had dropped her off without even saying goodbye. Not a great outcome for her. She fumbled with her keys, but quickly realized she couldn't get inside. That's when things got interesting. I watched her through the security camera as she stood at the door. She was groggy, pulling out different keys, trying to insert them one by one, but to no avail. Growing more and more frustrated, she threw her purse and wallet to the ground, muttering curses under her breath. Then she started banging on the door, ringing the bell, shouting, Are you in there? Why the hell won't this damn door open? I sent her a single message. Look at the sign in the yard. After that, I blocked her. It was the only clue she needed. She understood everything. New locks, and she was no longer welcome here. She screamed my name, demanding I come out, pounding harder on the door. I replied from the window, telling her that if she didn't leave, I'd send the footage to all her relatives and friends. She froze, realizing I'd been recording her the whole time. And that's when the tears started. Why are you doing this to me? She cried. The biting cold of the night pierced me to the core, constantly reminding me of the hours spent on the road in this freezing weather. My body felt stiff, almost numb. She stood outside, her voice trembling with desperation, begging me to open the door. Please, I'm freezing. I can barely feel my fingers. Let me in. But I stood firm, unmoving. I let her words hang in the air, choosing silence over action. Her voice began to quiver even more, growing increasingly frantic. Inside, a storm of guilt and indecision started to brew, but I didn't let it break my resolve. He forced me, she finally said, her voice shaking with emotion. I told him I never do anything without preparation, without precautions, but he insisted. The cold I felt then wasn't just from the night air, it was something deeper. After what felt like an eternity, I unlocked the door and stepped aside. She rushed in, immediately trying to embrace me, but I pushed her away. She collapsed onto the couch, tears streaming down her face, her strength fading. I let the silence envelop us, watching her break down before finally asking, why didn't you ask for help? My heart clenched as I forced myself to ask the next question. Did he force himself on you? She shook her head, sobbing. It wasn't exactly like that. He manipulated me. He said everything would be fine, that everything would be okay. But it wasn't... It was awful. Her words weighed heavily on me, but I pressed on. And it only happened... Once? Her answer shattered the last remnants of my self-control. No, it happened several times, three or four maybe, each time he convinced me to try again. Before she could finish, rage erupted inside me. You're lying, manipulative liar. Do you really think I'm that naive? Are you some helpless child who can't make decisions for yourself? I shouted, my anger surging. You weren't a prisoner. You were at a resort. You could have left, pushed him away, but instead you stayed, night after night, trying again. What were you looking for? the thrill you so desperately craved. Her sobs turned into desperate gasps as she tried to defend herself. It was in the middle of nowhere. I had no way out. I shook my head in disbelief. The middle of nowhere? It was a resort, not some desolate wasteland. There were people, staff, other guests. And if you were so scared, why didn't you call me? Her sobs continued, but she had no answer for me. I told her to leave and that she'd soon receive the divorce papers. In desperation, she pleaded, Please don't do this. I'm already suffering from what I've done. I know I made a mistake and I'm paying for it. You've already gotten your revenge by breaking this cycle. What more do you want from me? She cried out. I promise I'll be the wife you want. I won't complain. I'll do everything right. But I didn't waver. My voice cold as I told her it was already too late. The marriage ended the moment she left with him, without my consent. She desperately tried to justify herself. I swear there was nothing serious between us. He barely touched me. I didn't let him stay long. You know I'm always so careful. I let out a joyless laugh and replied, That's all well and good, but it changes nothing. It's over. I warned you there would be consequences. Do you remember? She asked, her eyes filling with tears once again. There was a time when I truly believed our marriage could survive anything, even this. 
I love you. And I know you love me too. Please, don't let it end like this, she pleaded. I responded with the cold, harsh truth. I once loved you deeply, but now all I feel for you is resentment and anger. Leave, unless you want me to send all our recordings to your parents. Her face froze in shock. She realized I had recorded even this moment. I'm not foolish enough to talk to you without evidence, I added. In desperation, she switched tactics, claiming she was going to press charges against Harry for assault and that she needed my support. I couldn't hold back my laughter. Good luck with that on your own, I replied. You'll have to deal with that, and our divorce. She begged me to stay with her during this difficult time, her voice trembling with fear, but I only opened the door. I never intended to deal with this alone, I reminded her. But it seems you were the one chasing thrills, weren't you? Well, now you've got more than enough. Two lawsuits at once. After what felt like an endless argument, she finally let out a sarcastic laugh. I had already sent the divorce papers to her office, though I had no idea where she was living now. Shortly after, a courier called me, informing me she had quit her job. So I sent the papers to her parents' address. Before the documents were delivered, I decided to speak to her parents personally. They had always treated me with respect, and I felt they deserved an explanation. When I arrived alone, the first thing they asked was, Where's Abigail? I answered directly, We're getting a divorce. I don't know where she is. The shock on their faces said it all. I briefly explained the situation, how she went on a date with a colleague despite my objections, and how I could never forgive her for it. Worried, her mother immediately called Abigail, urging her to come home. Abigail's response was that she had left town to stay with her best friend Susan and would return by the weekend. Whenever Abigail had problems, she ran to Susan. They had been inseparable since childhood. Abigail's mother then called Susan, who confirmed that Abigail was with her but was feeling unwell. Susan reassured her that she would take care of Abigail. Honestly, it gave me some relief to know she was safe. As my anger began to subside, and I learned she had quit her job, a part of me felt a slight concern for her. Abigail had paid a high price for her disobedience, but that didn't mean I would ever consider taking her back. This chapter of my life was definitively closed. As for the details of our divorce, three months later, we were officially divorced. I moved on, finding comfort in new relationships. And soon I was fortunate enough to meet a wonderful woman, an elementary school teacher. As for Abigail, six months after her nights with her rough colleague, she discovered she had contracted HIV. Her life has since changed dramatically. She is undergoing treatment with a psychologist and trying to live without me. I'm happy I never forgave her, because otherwise, I would have been infected too. She didn't just risk her own health. She could have endangered mine as well. Maybe I'm too angry with her, but I believe this cheater deserved it. My friend, and this is the end of the story. If you liked this story, then put your royal like and subscribe to the channel. May the force be with you.